Good morning, everyone. Shall we get started? Okay, so welcome back to Deep Learning and Neural Networks. Um, first of all, are there any questions for last class? Any, any questions? Good? Okay. So today we're going to talk in earnest about deep learning. Okay, so the, the main motivation and the main, uh, main reason we're here, deep architectures. So um, here's a rough outline. So first of all, I'll talk about basic general ideas of what does it mean to have a deep architecture? Why do we want it? And sort of what, what is the theme that happened in 2006 that made people excited about this area? Okay. And then we'll talk about two of these different approaches to doing deep learning. One is deep belief nets, which is a probabilistic approach. And then second is a stack autoencoder, which is easier to do. Um, but it doesn't have a probabilistic interpretation. Finally, I'll end by having some discussions. Okay, so again, you can please raise your hand and ask me questions anytime. English or Japanese is fine. Okay, so why do we want to do deep learning? So um, this goes back to what, what we mentioned last time. Basically, there's a promise that if you have a very deep architecture, maybe you can learn some very high level representation of your data. So here's an example from Yasha Benjo's book. Um, for example, you have an image here. This is actually Benjo. You have an image, and your raw representation of this image is a bunch of numbers. So this is the, say, the RGB values of this image, okay, of each pixel value. And from this very raw input representation, which you give to a computer, you want to get to a very high level representation of what does it mean, right? So when you look at this picture, what do you see? Do you see the pixel values here? Or do you see something more, more high level? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. So basically, when humans do these kind of things, quickly we extract very high level representations. So you notice there's a guy sitting here. There's some background involved. So if we want to do some real artificial intelligence, here's the argument that we need to find a way to go from raw data to very high level representation. So we know this is a man, it's not a woman, and we know that he's sitting, okay? So maybe there's another picture and it's a woman standing, right? So, but there's got to be a way to go from this raw data to this very high level representation. And the idea of deep learning is if you have a deep thing, you can, you can maybe do that. So there might be many ways to go about this. You can write rules, uh, but deep learning is a way to do it automatically with this deep architecture. So by deep, I mean that you have many lot levels where you go from raw input to slightly higher level representation and you gradually go up and up, okay? So the idea is as you go up a level, you can disentangle any factors of variation. So for example, when you look at um, the picture here, you see that there's some shading effects, right? So maybe there's a, the sun is here, so you see the, the background, the, the shading over here. And that actually doesn't matter for this understanding of this picture, right? Whether there's a shadow here, maybe it doesn't matter, right? So as you go up more and more level, the lower level might try to represent the shadow, but the higher level will try to disentangle this kind of variation. So when you have lots of pictures of people sitting, sometimes there's shadow, sometimes there's no shadow, but the high level representation will, will sort of say, I don't care. Right? Okay. So when you have some deep architecture, that's one way to, to do it. Okay. So that's the, the basic motivation. All right. And you can think of it as each level, here's your input is X. So this is the feature. So again, I'm using the subscript to represent the feature vectors, the feature values. So th it's a vector, feature vector of size three. So you have three features, and this is the first hidden layer, the second hidden layer, and you can keep on going up, and maybe this output says Man City, okay? So that's a general idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
there's no there's no clear definition what what do you mean by high level, high level right? So you can say um, what you think is high level really depends on the application. What do you want to do there? So say if you want to recognize um, this as this image as who's in it, right? right? Then the high level is not just mansuring. It's actually you want to know the who is this guy. So maybe you need to go even higher, right? Um, so you kind of you kind of don't define what each level is explicitly, but you're just hoping that you get more and more abstraction as you go up. Yeah. So this is um, you can think of this as a pixel. So this picture has three pixels. So it's a one feature vector of dimension three and three elements in that vector. Okay. So this is a nice idea. And um, last time when we talked about new neural networks, we said that if we can have um, many layers, we can actually have a lot of model expressiveness. So it's possible to theoretically to approximate anything in the world with a deep neural network, right? Um, but the problem is that it's actually hard to train, okay? So um, last time we didn't have time to talk about deep, uh, about back propagation, so we'll talk about it today. Um, but you can think of the number one reason why a deep neural network doesn't work is what's called a vanishing gradient problem. And later we'll, we'll discuss this in detail, but basically the idea is when you want to train this network from data, um, to train it, you need to um, back propagate the errors when you're updating these values. And the errors are of this form. There's always some multiplicative factor in it. And the thing is, if you have a very deep architecture, you keep on multiplying the terms. So in the end, the errors go to zero. So you actually have a very hard time trying to train this um, deep architecture. Okay, so that's, that's the main reason. And we'll later explain more in detail about back propagation so you know why this is a problem. So back propagation is called yes, 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 exactly. So there's a very simple reason why just mathematically um, op um, it's hard, hard to optimize these kind of architectures. So basically there needs to be a different way to train these. And that's what happened um, later. Okay. But um, so now let's go to, to talk about back propagation in detail. Okay. So recall last time we say, okay, this is a, a two layer neural network. So by two layer, I mean there's two, two sets of weights that you can tune. Okay, some people will call this one hidden layer neural network. Okay, but here I'm just saying this is a two-layer network. And this is basically, it's defining a function that looks like this. Okay, so you have, for each of the input, you combine the inputs to create three different <coughs> hidden nodes. Okay, so that's the term here. So you have xi, each of the xi multiply with your weights here, and that will be given into a sigmoid nonlinearity, and that will be the value h here. And then given these H's, you will again combine them with W, J to get this, okay? All right, so this is what we said last time. You can view, view these as hidden features, okay? So the question is, how do we train the W, J's and W, I, J's? Okay. So um, the basic idea with backpropagation is um, you have to backpropagate the errors. So general idea is, for each sample in your training data, first you try it out and predict. So do you get it right or wrong? If you get it wrong, you go back and adjust each of these weights so that um, you will get it right next time, okay? And the general intuition you can think of is, suppose, okay, suppose in a certain training example, these are ones and these are zeros, and say, anything coming out of these two have very high weights, okay? And suppose these are ones and this is zero, and you get it wrong, okay? If you get it wrong, that means these ones must be punished, 
to reduce the value, right? And this maybe needs to be encouraged to increase the value. So you would kind of want to downgrade these weights and the weights that go to here and upgrade these weights. That's a general idea. Okay, so let's actually derive this. Okay, so here um, I'm showing a slightly different architecture because um, so now we have two Ys, two outputs. Okay, and you can think of the maybe this is um, you're trying to predict two things at once. And I'm doing this because um, when we go to multi-layer problems, um, this is the form that we actually have. Right, so you can think of this as H, another level of H1 and H2. Okay. All right, so let's assume that, um, so for each input X, we have two outputs, Y1 and Y2, and we want to minimize the weights um, with respect to this squared error loss. Okay. So here, basically, we want to say the output so when I write in of k, that means it's the, it's the input going into this one, or the input going in this one, okay? So basically that's the final output. So we want the final output of um, y1 to be small, um, the difference to be small, and the final output of y2 difference to be small, okay? So that's a simple, earlier we had the square loss. This is basically a, a sum of square losses. Does that make sense? So now let's just take the, the derivative and see what happens, okay? So look at this loss, okay? And then I we're just gonna try it. So take the derivative of this guy with respect to Wjk, okay? So in all the notations here, i, this is i, level i, this is j, and this is k, okay? So wij is this level, wjk is this level, okay? Just try to remember that. So what's the loss with respect to Wjk, which is this level? Um, first of all, you can do chain rule, right? So you can say, okay, that's just a loss with respect to whatever goes into k and the derivative of in k over Jk, okay? That's a simple chain rule. You can write whatever way you want, but um, let's write it like this. And let's define this red guy as delta k, okay? It'll become easier later with this definition. Now what's this blue guy? The blue guy is, um, in k is basically what goes into node k, right? So what goes into this node k is the sum of these, weighted sum of these h's, right? So it's a weighted sum of h's weighted by jk, wjk, and that's, so it's a linear function, right? So does this part make sense? Right, and the derivative here is simple, right? Derivative of this linear function with respect to wjk is just hj. Okay. So you get a simple update here where um, if you want to update these weights, basically you look at is hj on or off, right? And then you, you will upgrade uh, in the direction of, of delta k. So later we'll explain what's delta k. So, so intuitively it makes sense, right? To update these weights, you look at this guy and this guy, okay? Now, what about these weights? So what's the loss with respect to wij? Wij is over here. Again, we use the same form. So now we're going to take the loss. This time we're going to do the chain rule like this. So the n is over j, okay? So basically what goes in here? Okay, and this part is nj, derivative of nj with respect to wij. Okay, does this make sense? It's the same, same form as this, but we're just using j here. Okay, so again, this can be defined, this red guy is defined as delta j, we'll derive this later. And what's the blue guy? It's actually the same form, right? So what goes into nj, so what goes into this guy is basically a weighted sum of these guys, right? So that's a weighted sum of these x's. When you take the derivative of wij, it becomes xi, okay? All right, so you can think of, these are very, um, it's kind of like parallel equations. So to update these guys, you depend on what, whatever hj is. To update these guys, you depend on whatever xi is, okay? So now what about delta k and delta j? So let's actually try to take the derivative. So 
delta k is the last derivative with respect to input. So you can think of it as how much do I need to change the input here to make sure that I minimize my loss, right? So, so this is the last term that we have. Right? This is the last term, which is this term. So you just put it here. And derivative with respect to nk um, is actually very simple, right? So it's only with respect to nk, so only the k that matters will be used. And then the two goes down. So you have this first term and then the chain rule derivative with respect to sigma in k, so you have this term here. Okay. So if you remember, that's actually the exact same equation when we derived the logistic regression last time. Right. So, so actually this part is simply logistic regression. Okay. So basically, if you plug these two together, to update these guys, you look at whether h is on, and you also look at whether there's an error. Okay. So if the error is zero, you don't update them. If there's some error, depending on the direction of the error, you will inc increase w or decrease w. And also there's a scaling by the derivative here. Okay. So when you're at, um, so this is a sigmoid which looks like this. So the derivative is high here in the middle and low when you're saturated. Right. So it was the scaling by that term. Now what about delta j? It looks a bit more complicated, but what happens in the end is actually a very nice equation. Um, so <coughs> delta j, so that's the loss. It's defined as the derivative of loss with respect to nj, right? So you have the loss with respect to nj, and loss has two terms here, two k terms here. So you can write it like this with the sum of k. And what's this guy? This guy is just delta k that we defined earlier. And this guy is just, um, you just take this and take the derivative with respect to nj, and you get the wjk term out and the sigma derivative term out, okay? So what happens in the end is that delta j, you can think of it as a weighted sum of errors from beforehand. So you can think of delta k is some error term. So delta k represents how much error you have at node k. And delta j, so first you take whatever's at delta k, and then you multiply it, weight it, with whatever connections that goes to you. So that's wjk. So that's the actual error you have. So in other words, say this guy has some error 0.2, this guy has some error 0.3, and what's the error here? The error here is basically this 0.2 multiplied by this weight plus the 0.3 multiplied by this weight. Okay, so that's the error that this guy needs to, to fix. Okay, and there's this, um, again, there's this saturation, this derivative term. It's not, not important. What's important is, is you have basically the error of each hidden node can be computed by the error of the previous nodes. Okay. So this was, um, when this, was found, um, it was actually very, very exciting and people call it um, a revolution in neural networks, so in the 90s. So basically, you can very efficiently update all the weights, right? So you just need to do one pass to compute what's the error here, and then for each of these weights, you just take the sum of errors, weighted sum of errors, and that can help you compute the update here. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. So the question is, so when you're dealing with image, right, what if there's some shift in the image or some jitter? How, how does this kind of architecture deal with it? And um, when we, so in the third lecture, we'll talk about computer vision. And they actually will encode some structure into this network. So they call it convolutional networks where you have sort of a sliding window of these weights at different positions 
of the image, and then you will combine those sliding window outputs. And that, that will be a way to deal with that kind of things. Yeah, so, yeah, I think later, later it will become clear how, how the vision people solve that. At the demo, the system is missing. Okay, so, so yeah, the question is what about overfitting? Yeah. So in this loss, we don't have some term that takes into account overfitting, right? So if we just plainly minimize this loss, I mean, it's possible we will overfit and on new data, we won't generalize. So in practice, you'll have some other term here. Okay. Yeah, but the, the important thing is the equation are very similar. So you always have some weighted sum of error terms, these delta terms. I think basically there was no good way to train these multi-layer before back propagation. Yeah. I, I could be wrong. I, I don't follow the old behavior that much. All right, is that okay? All right, so, so basically the algorithm, so I already mentioned it, the algorithm is very simple. So all the updates involve some scaled error from the output node times the input feature, right? So whatever you want to update this, involves this term and this term. Okay. So basically you do a forward pass and then a backward pass. So that's the basic idea. So now let's go back to, to the topic today. All right, so, so now maybe it's easier to understand this vanishing gradient problem. Because when you, when you want to compute the error at each of these terms, it's a weighted sum of the errors of the previous terms. Now, when you have a very deep architecture, the errors will just get keep on getting multiplied, and maybe in the end, you just won't ever update these lower layers anymore. So maybe you can do very well on updating these up, upper layers, but lower layers, they're just the same weights as the initialization. Okay. So that's why it's hard to train a deep architecture using back propagation. And here are some results showing that it actually doesn't work, okay? So this is, um, image digit classification. And what they've tried here, so this is um, from Erhan's paper. So they vary the number of layers in the neural network, okay? And this is showing the text test error, okay? So how much error you have. So here's the 1.8% of the, the test data were incorrect, right? And so the lower the better. And the way they initialize the weights so this is a, a standard way to initialize the weights, um, which is you take the fan in. Fan in is how many um, lower layers input into this node, right? So if you have if you have H here, the fan in is three because it takes three things into it. Okay. So this is a w one way people initialize is it depends on how many things go into it. Okay. So you take a uniform from this. And basically what you see is, okay, so when you have one layer, you have this error, and when you have two layers, it improves, it goes down. But when you have three layers, it starts to go up, and four layers is pretty bad, okay? So, so this is a, one of many empirical results showing that if you just use back propagation on randomly initialized neural nets, you just can't do well, okay? So even though we know theoretically these guys are more expressive than these guys, right? Model expressiveness, these guys are way better and more compact, but somehow the training just can't make it work, okay? So basically this was the state of art until 2006, and what people would argue is, oh, maybe it's a, a local optimum issue, because um, when you have a neural network, more than two layers, your objective function is not convex. 
right? So maybe this is your objective function, and there's two, two values here. And depending on your initialization, you'll go here or you go here. And it seems like back propagation is going to the, the wrong local optimum. I mean, this is kind of hand wavy. We don't really know what local optimum is good for generalization, but it seems like that's what's happening. So, I mean, it's standard to, to vary the range of your weights depending on how many things going, because it's a sum, right? So if you have many things coming in, the sum will be big. And if your sum is too big, we call we have the sigmoid function, right? If your sum is always very big, you are already saturated, so, so it's hard to train. Yeah. Yes, yes. But actually, we don't necessarily need to reduce the number of hidden nodes. So later we'll see that you can have the same hidden layer nodes sometimes. Okay, so far so good? All right, okay. So basically, what happened in 2006 is Jeff Hinton developed a new idea called layer-wise pre-training that sort of solved the problem that backpropagation had. And the general idea is this, okay? So rather than doing backpropagation where you predict the value at the lot, the final part, and then update each of them, you actually do it layer-wise, one at a time. So first of all, you train layer one, and you don't even think about these upper layers, okay? And so you basically train the weights here. And because you don't see the, up, the parts up here, you don't actually have the loss function with respect to the, the actual task, right? So you will, what he actually does is the loss function is the data likelihood. Okay. So you're training these weights. So these are hidden nodes. These are observed. You're training these weights to increase the probability of observing this data. So it's a probabilistic model in that sense. Okay. So you can think of, say, if people know Gaussian mixture models, right? These are the observations, and maybe these are some hidden units, and you want to just maximize the likelihood of the data. So first you train layer one, and then second step, you fix these layers so these things don't, don't change. So next time, you train layer two. So whatever data you have, you propagate here to get the values here, and then you, you fix this part and you ignore this part, and now again you train the second layer on the data likelihood objective. Okay. And you just keep on doing this, going up and up, and finally, you can use this to initialize a, a deep neural network. And then just do, so you initialize the weights now, not randomly, but using the pre-training results. And then after you, that, when you do backpropagation, you actually go to a, a much better local optimum. Okay, so that's what he found empirically. And sort of this is what um, rekindled interest in deep neural nets. Okay. And so later we'll explain in more detail how does this work? But if you think, the idea is actually very simple. Is you just train each layer one at a time, and rather than optimizing some, some discriminative loss, you optimize the data likelihood. Okay. So why does it work? Um, the, the sort of key philosophy is that you want to focus first on modeling the input P of X. Okay. And you don't worry about modeling the, the task you care about. So the task you care about is you want to predict y given x. So let's worry about that later. Let's worry first about modeling the data. Okay. So Jeff Hinton has this famous quote, if you want to do computer vision, let's first learn how to do computer graphics. Okay, so first learn the data, and then, then you can learn the prediction problem. Okay. And an extra advantage of this approach is you can actually exploit a large amount of unlabeled data. Because when you're training these hidden layers, layer by layer, you're just optimizing the data likelihood. So you don't need any labels. So you can exploit a lot of unlabeled data out there. And that's actually another reason that um, this new deep learning approach works very well. Is now we have so much data, so we can actually exploit it. All right. 
So are there any questions about this? Yeah. You can think of it like this. Um, so when you optimize the data objective and um, you're trying to basically find the hidden factors that explain these data points well, okay? And if you actually do it well, then all the variations in the data that don't matter will be canceled out. So only the variations in the data that matter will remain here when you try to optimize the data like you did. So basically, you can get a better feature. Right? So for example, in the image example, you have a lot of pixels. And maybe the pixel, exact pixel value doesn't matter because you have shading and all these things. But when you go up a, lever, a level, um, you have things that are not invariant to this shading. So then that's a better representation of the data. And that's why maybe these are better features. So when you later, when you train the discriminant system, you can do better. You can think of maybe just doing PCA, right? Say when you do PCA on your data, you care only about the dimensions that have the largest variance, and those are most informative. And so it's kind of the same idea, right? You're sort of transforming the input data to some dimension that captures the, the data better. Does that make sense? talk later how to optimize this. But P of X, so you need to define a, a probabilistic model, right? So define a probabilistic model that depends on these terms and this term, and then you optimize the parameters of that model. I think um, later when we talk about a concrete example, it'll become clear how we define it. <coughs> All right. Okay, so, so now let's talk about a concrete example. So this first approach is what Pinpin originally proposed called deep belief nets, DBNs. Um, and these deep belief nets are the fundamental unit is a restricted Boltzmann machine. So first of all, we'll talk about these restricted Boltzmann machines, how to train them. And you can think of basically each layer is a restricted Boltzmann machine. And that's the PX, that's the definition of PX. Okay. And um, turns out these are not that easy to train. So we'll talk about how to train them using some method called contrasted divergence. Okay. You can think of it as Gibbs sampling if you know the simplified version. Okay. And then finally we talk about how do we stack together these RPMs to form a deep belief net. Okay. So that's the rough. Um, outline. So, okay. So now, now we're going to define the RPM model. So we call the problem is we want to learn a function, original problem is we want to learn a function that goes from X to Y, but now rather than doing this directly, we're going to first go from X to some hidden layer. Okay, and then don't worry about the Y yet. Okay, so the question is how do we find a good H? And you can think of, there's many different deep learning methods. When you look at literature, people propose their own version. And basically, you can think of there are different ways to learn these hidden layers. But the general idea of all these methods are the same. They're just going to learn each layer separately and then stack them together. And they differ ma mainly by how they learn these single layers. So we're, let's talk about RBMs. Um, so a RBM, um, you can think of it as some sort of energy-based model. So you define the probability distribution like this, okay? So this is a probability distribution on X and H, okay? So on all the variables here. And you define it as um, the exponential of some energy function. And this energy function is simply this, okay? So you have the values of X multiplied by W, which are these weights, and multiplied by H, which are these checks, okay? So you can think of these are the, so they, they indicate the interaction between X and H, okay? This W will indicate 
uh, indicate that in passing. And then you also have some bias term. So the bias term for x will be d, and the bias term for h will be d. Okay. And for now, let's assume that h and x are all binary variables. So these can only be 0 or 1. Okay. And this is a probability distribution, so we need this to sum to 1. right? If we sum over all x's and what the h's, um, this value should be a 1. So, so this partition function, this normalizer, basically is this one, right? So it's a, this part, sum over all x and h. Now how many sums are there? There's a lot, right? So you can think of, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and each of them has two values, so two to the six possible sums. So sometimes this is expensive to compute. Okay. But um, so basically, this is how we define the model. Okay. And if you know, so if people know like uh, Markov random fields, you can think this is kind of like a simplified version of Markov random fields. Okay. It's a it's a Markov random field that has a particular bipartite structure where all the x's and all the h's are on separate sides, and there's interaction only between x's and h, but no interaction between the h's. Okay. And it's defined this way for, for computational reasons. It's easier to train this kind of things. Okay. And by the way, this is called restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, when you look at the literature, something called Boltzmann machine will also have interaction between Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can define any any dimension of x and h, any dimension of h you want. Let's just assume it's the same here. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Okay. All right. So let's give an example. Um, so suppose in this picture, let's assume the weights between x one and h one are very high. Okay. So this is positive, and H1, between H1 and H3, uh, X3 are high. So think of this, this guy, this weight, and this weight is a strong positive number, okay? And other, all other weights are some negative numbers, okay? So, and then let's assume that the bias terms, D and D, they're all zero. Okay, so let's only look at W here, okay? So if this is high and this is high, what is the setting of X and H that will give you the lowest probability? pop quiz. Okay, so this is high and this is high. Okay, all the others are low. So how should you set each of these, zero or one, so that you get a, a high probability outcome? Or you can think of it, if you look at this equation, right? be basically like this. Okay. So how do you set these? So so basically x you have x1, x2, x3, and then here's w, and then here's h. So h1, h2, h3. And we're going to say that what for x1 and h1, so there's nine values here. So this one is very large. And for h1 and x3, this one is large. Okay. And all these are small. Right, so what is the setting here? You have, you have two to the six choices, right? So how do you set this 0, 1, 0? so that you can have the highest probability here. Can someone give a guess? Yes, exactly, right? 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you want anything. If this is positive, then you want x1 and h1 to be positive, right? And um, also, um, x3 is related as well. So you want this to be, and then the other can be zero. So that's basically how you define this boundary distribution. Okay. So this this w basically tells you how things interact. And if they have a positive interaction, that means that both of them, both of them should be on at the same time. If they have a negative interaction, that means that if one is on, maybe the other should be on. Actually, here's a typo. I should say this is others to be zero. That's probably better. Okay. Yeah. So that's the answer. Okay. Any question? Did people understand that part? そうですね。あの学習問題は x が与えてどういう a どういう w を学習すればそのあの p of x の確率がさえでできる。でで h はわからないから何でもいいけどでも一番最適な w で一番最適な h が求めるからそれは一緒にまあ一緒に学習するみたいな。そうですね。で今言ってるのはただ例えば W が given でどういう設定が一番高くあの確率高いことになるのは今の問題です。Okay. So I think if you understand this part, the rest is actually、um, relatively straightforward.、Um, so it's just a way to define. A probability distribution. You can define any way, but this is one way that that we can decide to do. Okay. So now let's go forward.、Um, so the reason that things are defined this way is because of that it's very easier to compute the posterior. So by posterior, I mean suppose you observe x, it's very easy to compute h. Okay. Suppose you observe h, it's very easy to compute x. And basically, what happens is. Because of no interactions between these nodes,、um, computing given this computing the value of h is an independent problem. Okay, so probability of this h vector given the x vector is basically the probability of h j given x. So the product of these <coughs> probabilities. Okay, so、um, <coughs> so I won't go through the derivation here. Uh, but basically, you can think of it as,、um, but you just write it out, and maybe I'll go through it briefly. So, so p of h given x is p of x in h divided by the normalizer, right? Not normalized, but normalized by <coughs> the sum of the h, right? And when you just write this out as this,、um, basically what happens is that. Because these h's and x's factorize, so you can write this term out as a product of h j's. And when you can write it out this way, then this sum over、um, two to the sixteenth is actually an easy sum, right? You can distribute this sum into the product bell, and that's only because you can factorize. So after you do that. Then you get this simple form. Okay, so you can you can、uh, follow this later.、Um, but the general idea is that you can compute p of h given x as a simple product of probabilities. And what's actually what's this form p of h j given x? When you look at it, the probability of p of h j get equal to one. When you set this to one, what happens is You have a logistic regression here, right? Okay, so you can view this RBM as a bunch of logistic regressions.、Right? So again, here's a logistic regression term, 
there's another logistic regression, and here's a third logistic regression. And because there's no interaction, the joint probability of all of them is simply the product. Okay. Sorry. Does this part make sense? Any questions? So it's important that it's easy to compute this. So it's easy um, computationally. Because if it's not easy to compute the hidden features given the input, then it's very hard to do a deep architecture, right? If it takes you a lot of time to compute the hidden features, then maybe it's not worth doing a deep architecture. But now we see that it's actually very easy. So it's very fast to compute. Okay. So that you're good. これはただ so, so that's about computing p of h given x but now how about learning the weights, right? So there's always two problems when you define a probability model. How do you learn the parameters and how do you compute the value, the probability value? So we know computing the probability value is easy, but how about learning the parameters? Turn out to be hard. Okay, so um, to, to train these RBMs, so earlier I said we want to optimize the data likelihood, okay? So what's the data likelihood? So the data likelihood is simply the probability of x given your input sample xn. Right. So you can think of it as, okay, so now you have a bunch of samples. These x's are given to you, okay. So maybe you have samples 110, 111, 100, 100, again, you have many, many samples. And the idea is, okay, what will be the w setting that will maximize the probability? And so earlier when I said one one zero one, it seems like this is always on, right? So maybe you want these weights to be high. Okay, so basically you want to find the setting that will optimize the probability of this data. Okay. So this term is basically um, this term, right? So we only want to optimize the probability of data, but this RBM is defined over x and h, right, hidden node. So to maximize the probability of the data, we need to sum over, marginalize out the hidden node here, okay. And we're gonna take the log here for, ex for uh, simplicity of reasons. Okay. Okay. So this is the log data likelihood, okay. So this is standard, right? So when you do a logistic regression, and other, when you do say max ant or many things, um, you always, when you want to mop optimize some likelihood, then you conditional likelihood the same form, okay. All right, so what's this term? Um, let's just write it out here. So that's, this is our definition. And basically you see here, there are two terms, right? One is this numerator part, and one is this denominator part, okay? So because of the log, we can separate out. So here's the numerator, a denominator part, and the numerator part. And then now, basically, you can just go ahead and take the derivative with respect to w likelihood. Okay, so um, let's just look at this part now. So when you take the derivative with respect to w i j of this term, <coughs> right, um, looks like this, right? So because of log, 
this guy will go down here, right? And then he does a chain rule. You take the derivative with respect to this guy, and that's here. And you need to take the derivative with respect to the inside part, so that gives you this. Okay. And then similar, you do the similar thing for here. Um, the hard thing here is that z is a, it looks like this term, that is a sum over h and xz, right? And this is a big sum. Okay. But using the chain rule again, you have similar structure. So in the end, you get something like this. Okay. So you can see that you have um, the derivative of Wij with respect to the, uh, of the energy function. And this part is the same with the energy function, but your x is the actual sample. Okay. And here the probability is situated on the actual data sample, but here the probability is not situated on the data sample. It's summed over all x's. Okay. So in the end, what you get is you basically had have two expectations. Okay. And actually taking the derivative of this guy will just give you um, x, i, and j, right? So what's the derivative of E with respect to Wij? It's a simple term, right? Because the derivative of this guy with respect to Wij is simply xi times hj. So, so that's why you get this xi times hj out, you get this xi times hj. And the difference is, um, so here the expectation is over the model probabilities, and here the expectation is over the data. So, um, so if you've done, um, say, conditional random fields or, or any sorts of uh, the exponential model, you see that it's actually very similar form, right? So basically, to update Wij you want to go in the direction that depends on whether x, i, and h, j is on according to the data and whether x, i, and j is, h, j is on according to the current model. Okay. Okay, so this part may be a little bit hard to follow at first, but just remember that um, it's possible. So you can follow this later, but take the derivative and you have this simple form at the end. And later I'll explain the intuition of, of what this form is. Okay. So um, sometimes people call this term the positive phase and this term the negative phase. Okay. So you can think of it as this, this positive phase will try to increase the probability of generating Xn, differentiating the data point. And this negative phase term will try to decrease the probability of samples that are generated by the model. Okay. So um, maybe let's go through it again. So basically the idea is this. So say you have some P of X. So this is your current RBM. You have some random setting of Ws. Okay. And so here's the space of X. Okay. And you want to optimize the, the data likelihood, right? So suppose you observe xn here, which is this point. The probability of xn is not very high. So you want to find w that will increase this probability, okay? And in order to do that, basically, you can think of if you observe x1 equals to one, then you want to make sure that w1j will be increased. So you want to increase this probability. And at the same time, because it's a probabilistic model, you can't just increase someone's probability, right? So you also want to decrease other people's probability. So suppose this is a point that the model currently thinks <coughs> has high probability, right? So these points here, so all the points above this guy, the model thinks has high probability. So basically, you want to decrease those guys' probability because you haven't observed them in the data but somehow the model thinks it's high, so you want to decrease it, okay? So you can think of 
the second term here, we're going to add it, so it's going to try to increase the probability of Xn. And these terms here, because this, the expectation is over what the model thinks is high, right? So what the model thinks is high will be um, that big. Are there questions? This is probably the most difficult part of the entire lecture. So, okay, maybe let's look at this picture here. Okay. So this is it's just a different way to write. So um, you have this term is the probability of this um, model when x equals to a data point, right? This term is the probability of the model when you don't set x to be anything. It could be anything, okay? Now, um, so you can say, so say x has three nodes. So um, there's two to the three possible x's here, okay? But here, x is set to be one value. Okay. So that's the probability of that value. But here, now you're summing over these three other or these um, two to three other possibilities, right? So basically, the sum will be large for things that may not happen. So that's maybe that's better than two. So the first term is actually this. So, so I'm just taking, taking this term and uh, putting this over here. Okay. So that's the term over there. And you can think, so let's say x these are the possible values of And basically, for now, uh, maybe for simplicity, if the h sum is, is sort of hard to, to grasp, so let's just assume that um, we're only looking at this weight here and h of 1. Okay, so we have x, h, h of 1. Okay, and let's just assume that h of 1 is on. It doesn't have to be, but let's just assume that each of one is on. Okay. Now, the question is, okay, now, you have Wij. Do you want to increase it or do you want to decrease it? Okay. So if h of 1, so if h of so Wi1, that's, that's what we want. So let's assume that this is the actual sample we observed. Okay, so this is actual xn. Okay. So if this is actual xm, so let's 
the right out. So we have three weights now. So one, one, two, one, and three, one. So we need to figure out which one do we increase and which one do we decrease. Okay. So if this is our actual data point, um, basically because this is one, so we would want to, the second term is one, so we want to increase this guy, right? So because this is the second x2 to h1, right? So we want to increase this here. Now, what about the other points? Okay, so suppose um, all these other points were actually not observed in the data. Right? But um, for some reason, because of our current setting of Ws, they have very high probability. So suppose the probability of this guy, so let's say what's the probability is x here. Suppose now the probability of this guy is actually pretty high. Right. So, so this guy has very high probability according to the model, but we don't observe it in the data, so it's actually incorrect. So basically, we want, then that means we actually want to penalize the, the guys that make this high. So in, in that particular case, the difference between this guy and this guy is this term, right? So that means we need to make sure this one goes down a lot. Right, so when you have the sum over this, you can imagine the x's that have high probability under this model will, will have more effect here. So they will be subtracted more aggressively. The x's that actually have low probability, they won't matter that much. And here, the x that has high probability, if, if xm already has high probability, then it won't be updated that much either. But if x has low probability, then it, it actually matters. In general, you can just think of, to update Wij, you basically look at Xi and Hj, right? That's clear. So we know that if both of these are on, then Wij should be high. If both of these are, if they are, um, one is on and one is off, then maybe Wij should be negative, right? And the only thing we need to know is, we just need to adjust Wij so that on the training points, we get the right thing we want. And on the things that are not the training points, but somehow our model thinks highly of them, we need to make sure that they get decreased. Mm -hmm. Can that be changed? Uh, the increasing, increasing corresponding number in the three months? Yeah. Um, yeah, so just for, I mean, depends on all these other things, right? So these, these might change as well, but in this case, these two probably will have the largest magnitude, right? Because this probability is high. Uh, so that means that the probability should go down. Yes. So actually, all, all of them will change, um, but these two probably will be the biggest change. Yeah. Uh -huh. What's the difference between the two? The Ws. Um, so we just set them random at the beginning. Yeah, so you set them random in the beginning, and once you observe the data, then you will gradually update it so that it tries to prefer the data more. And that's basically what this is kind of saying, right? Because you want to optimize the probability of the data with respect to them. Okay. So, um, so this looks nice. The only problem is that this is actually hard to compute. Uh, because it sums over all possible x's and h's, right? And earlier we said that's two to the sum power. So basically it's hard to, to take this term. And um, if you know Gibbs sampling, you can think of, you can actually solve this by Gibbs sampling. 
So you can find this excitation by setting some x to some random value at first, um, and for h, and then for x, and keep on going back and forth, and that will actually find what the model think is high probability. If you do this for every single iteration of the gradient, um, that's very expensive. So contra contrastive divergence is something that Hinton developed, which is fa faster. You can think of it as running give sampling, but only with one step. Okay. So, so here's the actual algorithm. Um, so I think if, if all these things are not clear, um, at least try to understand this algorithm. Then, then you have a more practical idea of how to optimize these things. Okay. So let's let Xm be the training point and Wij to be the current model width. Okay. So this is what we start with. Um, so first of all, we will sample H. Okay. So for each Hj conditioned on this current sample is just a logistic regression term, right? So from this logistic regression term, we can get some probability, get some number out, right? And given that number, we can sample whether hj should be zero or one, okay? So maybe the sigmoid term will say that um, it's 0.7. So with 0.7 chance, you'll sample one. If it's 0.9 with 90% with chance, you'll sample one. Otherwise, it's zero, okay? So basically, first you compute this and then sample hj. And let's call this h hat of j. Okay. So you can think of this as the, the most likely h given your data point. Okay. Now, after you sample this guy, you go backwards and then you sample x. So now you set h to be h hat, so what you sampled, and then you again compute this equation. So now you go backwards. So this is computing the value of xi. And again, you sample xi, okay? And you can think of this as now, this is getting closer to what the model thinks is high. So the model will think that this x tilde has high probability, right? Okay. And because you need to, you need to have this h term too, so you do, it, do this one more time. So now you set the x to be x tilde and again, compute what should be the most likely h, okay, and sample, so this is h tilde j. So now you have, have four terms, right? You have the original x, you have the h hat given the original x, and then you have two tilde terms, so these are um, successive samples. Then you simply update with the following gradient, right? So you will add, so this is basically the data, Right, the data times what the data sampled h, h hat. So if both of these are on, you will increase this, okay? And this is what the model thinks highly of, but you will subtract it because the model is mistaken, right? Okay, so if you think of, if you do Gibbs sample, if you actually wanna do it the correct way, um, you will repeat h tilde and h j for a very long time, then you actually get what the model really thinks is high probability. But as a, as a trick, um, you just do it once, or twice, or three times, and um, you just use that as a substitute for the true uh, model sample. Okay. So it comes out to be very simple. Right? So that's the only update equation. So if you want to implement an RBM, this is the only thing you need to do, these, these five lines. So, so it's biased, right? So um, it's not actually optimizing the, the data likelihood, right? Because you, there's some bias going on here. So to really optimize that, you need to run basically Gibbs or NCMC to convergence. Then you can get the true value here. Okay. But now we're just, not, we're just going to skip it.
Yeah, so people will call it uh, CD-K, and K could be one, two, three, four, five. It, um, actually, what people do in practice is um, they could change the value of K for different iterations. So, so maybe, um, yeah, so basically, depending on whether your, your model is well trained, you, you increase or increase K. Oh, actually, we do iterate. So, so this is just for this one sample. We do this, but um, so we're you can think this is stochastic gradient descent. Yeah. So, for each sample, we do this. Yeah, and some people argue actually this is okay because we have many samples. Yeah, so, even if it's not entirely correct, um, after many samples, things kind of average out, so you actually get good reasonable answers. Um, you stop when things stop to change much. Okay. All right. So, so basically, you can think of this equation as, as this picture right there. Um, we want to increase this probability, and if we do true, um, true Gibbs sampling, we actually want to decrease the probability of the highest points here and here. That will give you the true, the true thing that the model thinks is the highest probability. But we only take one step, right? So the model maybe will give you this when we decrease this guy. So rather than decreasing this guy here or this guy here, you decrease things in the neighborhood of your training point. Yeah. So that's sort of the intuition. Okay. So. Um, Take a brief break. Okay, maybe let's take a three-minute break. Okay.
All right, so let's continue. OK, so we talked about what RVMs are, how to train them, and finally we'll talk about how do you stack them together to form a, a deep architecture called deep belief nets. So, I mean, the easiest thing is basically a stacked RVM is, becomes a, a deep belief net. All right, so again, we train this part and then we fix. Okay, then we train this part and then we fix. And then we train this part and then we fix. Okay, and then we just, this whole thing is our deep architecture. Okay, and you can actually interpret this as a, a very deep generative model because everything is probabilistic, right? So, um, what um, deep belief nets are is basically a interpretation of the stacked RBM as a generative model. And in particular, the interpretation is as follows, okay? So I mean, it, it might look a little bit funny at first, uh, but this is how the math will work out, is when you stack together all of these and train independently, um, your final network can be interpreted as your top layer is a RBM, and your bottom layer is no longer a RBM, but it's a directional sigmoid, okay? So, um, so the equation looks like this. So the top layer, so I'm using this prime and double prime to indicate the top layers. So you define, after stacking, you define the entire probabilistic model as this one, okay? So the top two layers, it's a joint probability here. So this is still an RBM. But the bottom layers, so from, from this part to this part, you only use the sigmoid equation. And from this part to this part, again, you only use the sigmoid equation, okay? Um, the, there are other ways to, to interpret this kind of um, stacking. And um, so I won't get into detail. But basically, you can think of, once you build this network, you can actually do something very interesting. Because it's generative, everything is probabilistic, you can actually sample data. So basically, first of all, you can, for RBM, you can set random H's here, okay? So for the two first two layers, you, you can do this kind of contrastive divergence thing or, or give sampling thing to get random H's. And once you get these random H's, you compute these guys um, sort of directly in one step. And you can generate data like that. So it's a, a generative model in that sense. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so directed just means that, so this term is just a sigmoid. Okay, so, so we just have the, hj given h at the higher level is basically the sigmoid of um, this h higher level of this weight map. Okay. So, so basically it's the logistic regression proper. But on, at the highest level, um, you actually have this term. So that's actually not defined like this, but that's still defined as a RBM. So it's still defined with this energy function, where this energy function is, is this. Yep. So it's slightly different form. So, so that's just how things will turn out if you if you want to make it a, make this stack network still a full probabilistic model. You can think of, if you simply stack things together, individually they are probabilistic models, but you can't guarantee that the whole thing is a probabilistic model, right? So this is one interpretation to, to enforce that this whole thing is still a probabilistic model, which means that things will sum up to one. Okay. But you, you actually don't need to do that, so you can simply treat this as initialization to a neural network, right? So, so that's what I said earlier is, um, in the beginning of today's lecture. So after you train each of these layers, right, you can take these Ws and just put it into a neural network. 
and then do back propagation training. So that's the second way to use RBMs. <laughs> so and and probably if you if you are interested in deep neural networks, that's the easiest way. Is um, you just train a bunch of RBMs, but after you train them, you forget that they were RBMs. You just take the weights and then initialize your neural network with those weights. And actually, people in speech do that, so they don't really care about this probabilistic interpretation, but they use RBM to train, and then finally they just put everything in the neural net. But, um, but there's a, if you read machine learning literature, there's a lot of excitement on this kind of thing because it's actually a deep generative model of the data. So you can do actually kind of interesting things with that. So here's an example of what you can do with a deep generative model. Um, so this is from Rosalind Salak Junov's paper, and um, he's actually not using a deep belief net. He's using something called deep Boltzmann machine. So DB, DBM versus DBM, they're actually s different things. So there are different ways to interpret this um, stacked RBM. Okay. But I won't go into detail. But basically, um, with he has an architecture like this. So one RBM, to uh, one RBM, two RBM. I don't know if it's two or three RBMs. But after giving about 200, uh, 20,000 images to this deep network, it can train. So after training, you can generate random samples. Okay. So basically, you can set random units here and then generate the sample. So this is actually what you can generate, which is um, amazingly good, right? So you can think of this, this is a training sample, so these are actual real images, okay? And this is the image that's generated by the model, right? And if you think of it, this, this image, it has a pixel dimension of about 9,000, right? So if you think of, you generate 9,000 pixel image randomly, you get uh, very, you get black kind of noise, right? But you can actually generate things that have a lot of structure, and they look like original images. So this is what a deep generative model can do. If you only have one layer, um, it's very hard to generative generate this kind of data. Now, of course, if you don't care about building a generative model, if you don't, if you only want to do well in your task, do some discriminative training, then you don't need to do this. Okay, so you don't need to do all these things. You can just initialize your your neural network with the RBM weights. All right. Okay, so things to remember about DBNs: um, layer-wise tr pre-training. So everything we talk about, most important concept is this layer-wise pre-training. And why this pre-training works well is first you try to model the data first rather than directly trying to model the task. Okay. And why do we use RBM? Because it's tractable to compute the features because things factorize. Um, although training can be expensive. Okay. So, and stacking RBMs, you can form a generative model or you can initialize um, that's all about DBMs. Any questions? Yeah. H do no sorry. H no jigel dos. H wa 自動的に学習されるから何得られるかわからない。そうそう。うん。H
じゃあた例えばこの,この間の例でこう,いうこういうエイジが出てきたねあのこの人も、まあ、似てるものを使って最初のイメージから最初学習した H は H みたいなものが学習した。そうそう、ピクソルから H が分かる。はい。で、自動的にこれを最適化するとき、データが、データはすべて人間の顔だから、その,その人間の顔を最適化したければ、まあ、自然にこれが最初に出てきてで次はこういうものが出てきてで最後はこれですねそうですねはいそれもあのあのデザイナーが決めるそう多い<笑>そ,こそこがディープ・ラーニングの難しいところですそう、そう、で、トレーニングデータ for the second layer RBN is basically you have the original training data and you pass it through the layer one RBN and then you fix it. So that would be the training data for layer two RBN. Yeah. So in this case, for the training layer two, you probably get a bunch of edges. あ,のあれはそうあれはただあの一番上のまあ今例えばこれもスタックしてでまあこういう確率モードを定義しましたでじゃあ PX を生成するあ X を生成するときは H prime と H double prime はランダムに設定してでもしランダムでもあのこれに対して高いものを高いえっと確率が高いものを H と H prime と H double prime は選べるでこれ高い確率のやつを選んだら次はこれの高いやつを選んでで次はこれ高いやつをで、最後これ全部できたら、その X 出てくるものはイメージプレイになる。それはちゃんとそのデータの構造を学習したという証明です。そうですね。まあ、実際は適当じゃなくて、そのこれ P に対して確率高いものを、最初は適当に決めて、で、あのギブサンプルで一番。いいものを取ってきて、でそれで最後エクスが出てくる。Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm, so RPN, everything here, you can. 全部あのロジスティックリフレッシュみたいになってるんですね。プレセプションはその最後セグモイがなしでそこが違う。プレセプションはセグモイじゃなくてそのあのランプファンクションみたいなそこが違うけどでもあのロジスティックリフレッシュの掛、まあ、け算みたいなものを考えるだけ。だそんなに実はそんなに難しいモデルではないただこういうこういうものを定義するだけですこういう確率モードを定義する X と H のインタラクションをちゃんとモデルしたい
for you more believers. So if you want to generate data, you probably will want to do it through convergence, like you generate big data. Yeah. OK, so I think we're out of time. So next time, they'll talk about a simpler method to do all this. Um, so next time, we'll talk about autoencoders. And can you think of autoencoder as a, a approximation of RBA? Just to give you a brief outline, what we're going to do is we're going to, given x, we're going to sort of compress x into some hidden layer h. Okay. And then from this hidden layer h, we're going to decompress to go back to x. Okay. And then we want to make sure that the difference between the original x and the new x is low. Okay. So basically, you compress your data and then you decompress it, and then you want to make sure that your compression doesn't lose any important information about the data. Okay. And if you have done that, that means that you learn to uh, model the, the important factors of the data very well. Okay. So um, yeah, we'll talk more, ab uh, more about this next week. And you'll see that it's actually, you can, it, can, it can be interpreted as doing some sort of contrastive divergence training but without all the probability. Okay. All right. So, so see you next Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is probably the hardest part of the course, so if you survive this, you'll be fine. <laughs> oh, and if you ask questions, um, please, please write them down so I can keep track.